Once again, it's time for another question show. This is turning into like my favorite part of doing this channel. So thanks to everybody who sent in all of your questions. As always, if you're watching any episode, and you've got an idea for a question, whether it has anything to do with that episode or not, just go ahead and type in the question into the YouTube comments and I will gather them, them up and answer them here. Short questions are better. Also, just want to, again, thank all of the people who've come on Patreon in the last little while. It's made a huge difference. You've probably heard about the YouTube ad apocalypse. A lot of creators are being squeezed uh, because of all of this ad funding. And so now is a really good time to directly support the creators that you love. I support a pile of creators who, all the stuff that I see on a regular basis, uh, and you should probably do the same. So if there's someone that you like, figure out a way to support them directly so that they can just keep doing what they love, what you love, and don't have to worry about uh, the fickle advertising industry. All right, let's get on with the questions. Zach the Ripper. I still can't grasp a no center universe when it started from a one point explosion. I understand what you're saying, but I just can't put it together. Understanding the topology and shape of the universe is not one of those things that you just kind of like, oh, now I get it. It takes some time and you're gonna be uncomfortable for a while. Now we've done a whole episode on how you got from a singularity to potentially an infinite universe. And so that's a whole separate video that I did with Dr. Paul Metzetter. But, but just this understanding that you can have a thing that is expanding that has no center. And, and we, ha we can only work in analogies, right? Because our brains are, are located in three dimensions and we can't really understand this. But the best example to do is, so let's just make it as simple as possible. Imagine a circle, right? You've got a circle and imagine a point on the circle. And then you follow the, the circle around and go one way, go the other way. And there is a set distance it takes you to return to your starting point. Now, if you make the circle bigger, there's, you're, now it takes you longer to get back to your starting point. But if you look at just the, the, the path that you take along that circle, there is no center. Now, I, of course, you're looking at the circle, well, the center is right in the middle of the circle. But that is because you're looking at a, what is essentially a one-dimensional journey from a two-dimensional point of view. And so if you take a sphere, and you've got you know, some object, two objects on the sphere, and you follow the path around that sphere to your starting point, it takes you a set amount of distance. And if you expand the sphere, that distance takes longer. And yet, there is no place that is the middle of the surface. Remember, the surface of the sphere. And so, that's how you can have an expanding sphere, and everything is getting further apart, but everything is seeing that equally. Now, of course, your three-dimensional brain, and so you're imagining the middle of the sphere, the space, that's where the center is. But again, that's only because you have the ability to see one more dimension. And so when you imagine the universe with its three dimensions, it behaves in the same way, in that it, if, if it's finite, you move in one direction far enough and you return to your starting point, and <clears throat> it acts like it is a sphere, but you know, that, that surface of a sphere, but taken one more dimension up. And so we always joke that like a four-dimensional creature could look at this and go, oh, I totally get it. But because we're three-dimensional creatures, we have to keep trying to sort of use analogies and try to wrap our brains around it. Peter Houle. Might it be necessary to clean out a Lagrange point for potential use? I think I heard that Earth's Trojan asteroid is in one of them, and the James Webb telescope will be deployed at the Earth-Sun point. I'm worried that something is already chilling and would damage the telescope. There are a total of five Lagrange points. There's the L1, L2, and L3, and they are the ones that are kind of lined up in between the two objects. So if you've got, say, the Earth and the Moon, <clears throat> you've got the, one, the L1 point, on the in between the Earth and the Moon, you've got the L2 point on the far side, and you've got the L3, which is on the far side of the Earth, right? Those are your three, those first three Lagrange points. And they are unstable. And what that means is that if you place an object in any one of those three Lagrange points, like where the James Webb Space Telescope is going to go, they will drift out just automatically. They would just drift. There's no way to keep them stable without using some kind of propulsion system. 
So there is nothing waiting in those Lagrange points. They are, they are constantly, if you, just, if you dropped James Webb in the L2 Lagrange point without some way for it to maintain that position, it's just gonna, it's just gonna move away. Now the L4 and the L5 points, the ones that are ahead or behind the, you know, in orbit, those are stable. And if you did try to place a spacecraft in one of those points, you would have to make sure that there aren't objects bumping around inside that Lagrange point. But where James Webb is, there's nothing there. Nothing can remain there without some kind of rocket. It's just that it doesn't take very much energy. It takes a tiny little amount of energy to maintain your position. And as you drift out of it, it takes more and more energy to get back into that Lagrange point. Re-zero. Question. How does gravity escape a black hole? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, right? Uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, the black hole is so powerful that nothing, not even light, can escape its grasp. And so how can gravity escape its grasp? But, but gravity is not this thing that's reaching out and sucking things in. It's not like a vacuum cleaner, right? Gravity is, is the distortion of space-time caused by mass. So the gravity from a black hole wouldn't even exist if the black hole didn't have mass and it was distorting the space-time around it. And, and so uh, you can kind of, you know, you've seen that kind of classic picture of, of like something that looks like it's, I don't know how to describe it, like a funnel, right? Where you've got this point of mass at the bottom and everything is kind of pushing in. And so when objects are moving through space, going around a black hole, for example, to them, the space is straight and they're moving forward, but actually they're following a curved path around a black hole or down into a black hole's gravity well. So, so gravity is not a thing that a black hole can, can suck in. It's just the, what you get when you have a lot of mass. SCP-77 Rising. Your videos and knowledge have been instrumental in my upstanding of astronomy. A hearty thank you to you. Now, as a Catholic apologist and amateur astronomer, I would love to hear your take on intelligent design. Keep it up, Fraser. In my opinion, there is not any evidence for intelligent design. The evidence is overwhelming for evolution. If, if evidence for intelligent design showed up, then, then it's something that we would have to take seriously. But so far, there has been no evidence presented for any kind of intelligent design that couldn't be also explained by evolution. Now there are deep questions about where, where did life, where did the first life come from? Where, uh, you know, how did some evolutionary steps, how do we go from, from single cellular life to multicellular life? How did DNA, RNA, these, these core questions to, to the theory of evolution and just to life itself are still, they remain unanswered. But the, the only answer that we can really give is, I don't know. I don't know where they came from. And, and anyone who tells you that they do know, they don't know. And, that's, and until we have a theory that really helps to explain it, we just have to go with, with I don't know. Sperse. I think humans are losing interest in space travel, and that's very, very bad. Humans are not losing interest in space travel. Right now, we have SpaceX which just reused a rocket and is looking for ways to bring down the cost. They're gonna build the biggest rocket that's ever been built in the next couple of years, and they're planning on sending hundreds of thousands of human beings, uh, like a million people before the end of the century. They've got a competitor, the second richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, building a rocket company that is similar and it's gonna be producing rockets of the same capability. At the same time, NASA is building the SLS, which is a massive rocket capable of sending humans back to the moon and maybe even explorers to Mars. Not to mention what's happening with the Chinese that have their own completely different space exploration efforts. They've got space stations and they're planning to go to the moon. We have never had a time in human history where we are more capable and more enthusiastic about exploring space and, and to be there to stay. There are companies working on mining uh, asteroids reusable uh, uh, aircraft that may be able to even fly to space. There's so many great ideas happening right now. I, I totally disagree with that. Mr. Wow Bill 47. Fraser, you mentioned in a multiverse, each universe could have totally different constants and laws of physics. This has me wondering, could the speed of light in any multiverse be different than the speed that we know it, faster or slower? 
In our universe, there are a bunch of constants. There are these, these numbers that are that sort of underlie the laws of physics as we understand them. The speed of light, the fine structure constant, the force of gravity, the, uh, the binding force of atoms. And, and all of these numbers, they're, they're completely unrelated to each other, and they seem completely arbitrary. So there's no reason why the speed of light has to be the number that it is, it's just the number, and then you punch that into, into the calculations that you're going to make. So the thinking is that in some other multiverse, all of those numbers would have different constants, and then that would have consequences. So if the binding force of atoms was too strong, then matter couldn't form properly, or gravity wouldn't work the way that it does, and so the speed of light could totally be a different number and that would have deep consequences. And it could very well be that in the vast majority of the universes out there, we can't have life, we can't have the things that we see here in our universe bec just because they're all so different. Lord Black, can a galaxy exist without a black hole in the center? Right now, astronomers think that there are supermassive black holes at the heart of pretty much every single galaxy in the universe. But there are some without black holes, but it looks like some kind of event happened to kick the black hole out. And so what you can get is you can get these collisions between galaxies, especially when there's a big difference in the mass of the black holes at the heart of them. So you say you've got one that's got maybe a black hole that has five million times the mass of the sun, a tiny supermassive black hole, and then one with, say, a billion times the mass of the sun, and they collide together, the low mass one can actually get kicked right out of the, out of the galaxy. And so you could end up with, with, and as these two galaxies kind of go past each other, and now you've got a galaxy where one has had its black hole stripped away. But it wouldn't, I mean, the galaxy would be kind of torn up and messed up, but it wouldn't necessarily not be able to be a galaxy anymore. They, these supermassive black holes, they don't act like an anchor for the center of the galaxy. They're really only a tiny percentage of the mass of the whole galaxy. What really holds a galaxy together is the halo of dark matter that surrounds it. James Craver, here's another apocalypse level scenario for you. If a planet is enveloped by its star, does that necessarily mean the end for that planet? For example, if the surface temperature of the star is low enough and the star contracts again, could the planet survive? I mean, obviously everything on the planet would be toast, but would the planet itself be able to survive? It really depends on how long the planet spends inside the atmosphere of the star. But, like, yes, it's awful. It would be terrible, right? You'd be inside a star. That's, that can't be good for your health. But when it's inside the atmosphere of the star, this atmosphere acts causes friction, right? The planet is now plowing through this material of the stellar atmosphere, and that will cause the planet, it, that friction will cause the planet to slow down in its orbit and start to lose orbital velocity, and it will start to spiral inward deeper and deeper into the star. So if it happens very quickly, then the planet would still be there. But if it takes a long time, then the planet is going to spiral inward and just join the core of the star, and then it's never going to be revealed again. Eric Horning. I read somewhere that a photon produced in the core of the sun can take up to 10,000 years to work its way out of the sun and reach the earth. Is this true? And if so, what makes it take so long to get out of the sun? It could even be a bigger number than that. It might be 50,000 or 100,000 years, maybe even a million years. And what's happening is you've got at the core of the sun, you've got fusion. And atoms of hydrogen are coming together and they're forming helium and that process is is exothermic it releases energy in the form of photons of gamma radiation so you got gamma radiation being released in the core of the star and then those photons are are getting absorbed and re-emitted over and over and over again and it's completely random and so you imagine you've got at the very center of the star, you've got this photon just going bounce, 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 bounce. And what direction it moves in is a completely random direction. As it gets outside of the core, it moves to this, the radiative zone. And where in the radiative zone, that's all that's happening is these photons are radiating around. They've got to, they get radiated, absorbed, and they're moving at the speed of light, right? They're going bounce, 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 bounce. 
but they take all this time because it's completely random and they've got hundreds of thousands of kilometers of distance to randomly escape out into the, um, into the next level of the sun where they can actually be pulled up by um, you know, these sort of pillars of plasma and actually make it out into, out into space. So it's really, it's just that the sun is so big and the process of random, you can imagine a photon could go all the way out almost to the end of the radiative zone and then randomly make its way all the way back into the radiative zone and across the other side of the star and do circles around it until it finally gets out. So that, that time is average. It could take much longer and it could happen much more quickly. Philippe. So is the sun big enough to dilate time or do we really need something as big and massive as a black hole? I'm not sure I even understand what I just asked. The subject is so far out. All mass causes time dilation. In other words, you being here on the surface of the Earth, you are getting time dilation different from the astronauts that are on board the International Space Station. And if you were on the surface of the sun, you would experience more time dilation. And think about the movie Interstellar, if you saw that, right? They were close to the supermassive black hole, and so the rest of the universe experienced more time than they did. They thought they were down there for a couple of hours, and they came back, and it was decades back on Earth. And it was a result of being close to a massive gravitational body. Same thing happens with here on Earth. It's just that the difference is very low. If you live on the top of a mountain, you experience time differently from the people that live down at the bottom of the mountain. But it is in nanoseconds for your entire life. The cool thing is that there's, that's different from the time dilation that happens when you're moving quickly. And so when you think about the astronauts on board the International Space Station, they are at a distant level of gravity away from, from, <clears throat> from you on the surface of the Earth. And at the same time, they are moving much more quickly. They're moving 28,000 kilometers per hour around the, around the Earth. And so their time dilation actually bounces. They're, they're experiencing one kind of time dilation from the gravity and a different kind of time dilation from the motion. And in fact, I don't know the exact number, but the place where those two things actually balance out and the time dilation is, is canceled out. So absolutely. Takina Delimi. Imagine if there are two kinds of life on Titan, the surface lake methane and propane-based life, and the subterranean one being water and carbon. Cool worlds out there. You can imagine there's this vast ocean of water on Titan, and deep inside, right, there could be life, like with Europa or Enceladus. And then at the same time, you've got that surface of Titan with these liquid hydrocarbons, and there could be uh, some kind of exotic form of life that uses liquid methane as a solvent instead of water. And they could be two completely different ecosystems. Or maybe they mix in some way. It's absolutely fascinating. We have to send a spacecraft back to Titan. Alex Gauchipman. When will space agencies switch to drone exploration instead of ground-based rovers? I guess when you're saying drone, like you're talking about flying rovers, airplanes, uh, there are some plans to send some flying robots to other worlds. There's like only a couple of places in the solar system where that would really work. Mars, it has very low gravity. It would be a hard place to send an airplane, but it is theoretically possible. Venus, which sucks, but it has a very thick atmosphere, and so you could theoretically have some kind of, of, of airplane there. And uh, Titan which is like the perfect place to send an airplane. You couldn't take solar power, but you could have some kind of, of nuclear uh, thermal reactor, and that could power an airplane that would, that would be able to move in the thicker atmosphere but lower gravity for a very long time. And I think Titan is the perfect place. Let's send, a, let's send an airplane to Titan. I'm, I'm on board. All right, well, that's it. Another week, another question show. Thanks everybody for sending in your questions. As always, wherever you are on the YouTube channel and you, an idea for a question comes up, go ahead and type it in there. Also, you might have noticed I've been starting to do question shows specifically for teachers, for classes. So if you are like a science teacher or you're, do, you know, you're teaching some kids about astronomy and you want a special questions show just for you guys, just let me know. My email is in the... In the description. All right, see you next week. Right, as we feel, as 
We'll see us, do this again.